Great, I'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium's webinar. I am Hikmet Burak, a board member of the IWGSC. We're joined today by Heidi Serra. I'll give you some detail about it. And before I go, we go into the, um, the webinar, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the IWGSC. So I'll go ahead and get started with the, uh, the total members of IWGSC. We do have uh, like 3,200 members over 71 countries. And we have currently eight sponsors and uh, we work with almost 900 institutes and companies. And then uh, we like to thank our sponsors that makes this everything almost possible. Arbor Bioscience, BASF, INRA, RAGAT, Illumina, Syngenta, Flormo, uh, Desperate, Kansas Wheat. And our vision, which we what we call is the IWGSC 2.0 vision, is to enhance the breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of the traits and their their allelic diversity. And this year's activity include activities include uh, close collaboration with Arbor Bioscience to produce and uh, develop some new resources and tools for the wheat community. We've been also joined by Illumina that we can provide and develop new tools and, and resources for the community. And recently, I'm sure that you'll aware that we do have IWGSC RefSync version 2.0 one is online currently with the uh, full complete annotation. You can, and all the community members can easily and freely use without any restrictions to in their programs. We also work with the publishing uh, clear process for the manual and functional annotation as well. And um, we do have uh, IWGSC Wheat Diversity Project. We would like to continue to fundraising. We're continuing to refsec, seek high sec, uh, refsec of the eight land races, uh, which represents the breadth of the wheat diversity to develop a strong base for the haploid uh, 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 resources. And currently, we do have also like a pre publication of release of this, some genome sequences of elite varieties and some other resources that are deposited in the URGI. And of course, that the webinar, IWGSC webinar is still ongoing and we will continue. And I just wanna remind you that uh, the webinar is recorded and will be posted on the IWGSC YouTube channel in a few days. And please, you, so you can subscribe to the channel to never miss a new upload as well. Right after presentation, we'll, uh, it'll follow by a question and answer panels that you can see in your panels. And then in the question panel that you can submit your questions and I can see it. And in the chat panel, you can monitor the chat panel to see the messages from the organizers as well. And in handout panels, you can easily see the uh, outputs I'm sure that you already uh, downloaded the handouts for yourself as well. And today, again, uh, we're joined by Heidi Serra. She's a research scientist at CNRS in France. She is going to talk about uh, identification of the long sought after PhD two genes, PH2 genes, a step towards the control of homeolox homeolo recombination in wheat. Again, thank you so much and thank you, Heidi. I will turn it over to you. With that, uh, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. you.
Okay, can can you see my screen, Hikmet? I can see your screen. I think that you need to just make it a full screen. I can see your screen. So I'm already full screen with my pointer. Can you see it? Um, can you see the slide moving? Hold on a second. Yeah, let's uh, just. Uh... Um, Heckman, can you see my screen? I can see your screen, yes. Also the second slide? Yep, I can see the second slide okay, as perfect. well. Okay, perfect. Everything yep. is working. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, hi everyone and thanks uh, Heckman and also thanks um, to the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present my work today. Um, actually, the, the story that I will tell you about today was part of my uh, postdoc at INRAE and was focused on the identification of the PH2 gene, a gene involved in the control of homeologous recombination in wheat. And before to start, I would like to highlight that this work was actually a very collaborative work between three different teams in three different countries. The Pierre Saudi Laboratory at the JDEC unit in Clermont-Ferrand uh, in France, the Jan Bartosz Laboratory at Olomouc University in Czech Republic, and also the Ute Bauman Lab in Adelaide in Australia. Okay, so let's start. As you know, uh, one of the main challenges of modern agronomy is to produce new and innovative crop varieties in order to introduce, um, I mean, increase gene varieties. And a way to improve those varieties is to use the genetic pool and the genetic diversity of the wild relative species of those elite varieties that can contain many interesting traits like disease resistance, abiotic stress tolerance, or quality traits. The process of introducing those powerful and innovative alleles within our elite varieties is what we call DNA introgression that corresponds basically to the transfer of DNA through the species barrier. So what is the mechanism behind? DNA uh, introgressions rely on meiotic recombination um, meiosis is a key step of the developmental cycle of all sexually reproducing organisms and allows the production of haploid gametes from a diploid cell. During the first stage of meiosis, which is called prophase 1, chromosomes condensate and homologous chromosomes, I mean the chromosome coming from paternal and maternal origin from one pair, must recognize each other pair and recombine together. And this is via the formation of crossovers, crossovers being the reciprocal exchange of large DNA fragments. During metaphase one, pairs of homologous chromosomes align along the equatorial plates of the cell. And during the anaphase stage, the two chromosomes from each pair will be pulled out of the pole of the cell and ultimately in two different cells. The second division corresponds this time at the separation, the segregation of the chromatids. One of the key roles of crossovers is to maintain together the two homologous chromosomes, and that is absolutely required for the accurate uh, chromosome segregation at anaphase stage. What is the mechanism of my meiotic recombination? Here is a very uh, simple schema. You have a double strand DNA here, and uh, this process starts by the uh, induced double strand break, which is programmed by the SPO11 protein. After a step of resection, the single strand DNA will search for a homologous sequence. Uh, via invasion and uh, identification of a region which is uh, highly similar. After DNA synthesis, 
and second end capture, the uh, double holiday junction will be formed. And this structure can ultimately be resolved as a crossover or as a non-crossover. A very important step in this process is the search of the homologous sequence. Um, and this would be more complicated in allopolyploid uh, species because of the presence of related but non-identical chromosomes. As an example, bread wheat is an allopolyploid, as you all know, that originated from two interspecific crosses between diploid species. And as a consequence, its genome is composed by three subgenomes that are home homeologues. So within one nucleus, you have homologous chromosomes that come from one parent, but also homeologous chromosomes. Those chromosomes have a common origin, evolved independently in different species, and are now together in the same cell and the same nucleus. They can be very similar, and that is the real challenge during meiosis because homologous chromosomes and homeologous chromosomes have to uh, re recognize each other and make a difference between those different kinds of uh, chromosomes. If we look at chromosome spread of, uh, meiotic, of wheat, wild type wheat at meiotic metaphase one, we see a lot of little rings. Actually, those rings correspond to two chromosomes linked together by two crossovers at terminal or subtelomeric, subterminal, sub sorry, uh, location. We sometimes see rare uh, little tick corresponding to rod bivalent. And again, it is two uh, chromosomes linked together by one crossover that can be a terminal or subterminal uh, location. So here, uh, additional experiments show that the chromosome linked together are actually homologous chromosome and never homeologous chromosome, meaning that in the white type context, homeologous recombination is inhibited during meiosis. And this is a real barrier and limitation for introgression because uh, as homeologous recombination is as uh, very rare, a rare event, the efficiency of introgression is very low. If we can unlock homeologous recombination, this will, this will uh, obviously increase the efficiency of introgression. There is a second problem as well. When introgression works, we face the problem of linkage drag. This is because only huge DNA fragments are introgressed, meaning that uh, not only the interesting genes are coming, but also a potential large number of deleterious genes. As an example, here you have the 2N introgression, which is coming from Agilops ventricosa, on the 2A chromosome of the cultivar, Renan cultivar of wheat. And you can see here on this graph, which show the recombination frequency, that recombination is completely inhibited in that region, meaning that we can't break, break this huge fragment and uh, potentially remove those deleterious genes. So if we unlock homeologous recombination, we will increase the frequency of introgression, but also uh, try to, to face the linkage drag phenomenon. What do we know about homeologous recombination control? Homeologous recombination is under the control of two main genes and few additional genes that I will not uh, show here. The first one is PH1 for pairing homeologous 1. And compared to the Y type, well, where a lot of uh, rimbivalent are observed, in the absence of the pH1 locus, we found this kind of structure that corresponds to multivalent, meaning that it's more than two chromosomes that are recombining together. And this is picture at metaphase one. So it means that homeologous recombination is possible and uh, is increased when the pH1 locus is not present. Using anaploid lines, uh, the pH1 locus have been localized on the long arm of the 5B chromosome quite a while ago now. The cloning of this gene, which is more recent, have uh, showed that it corresponds, it, it is localized in the 2.5 megabase region, 
uh, with where we found um, heterochromatic blocks coming from the 3B chromosome, which is a duplicated uh, region. There are few meiotic genes, including the Z4B2 gene that seems to have a, a high effect on the phenotype. And this block is inserted within a complex of four CDK2-like genes. More recently, the laboratory of Gramour um, tried to identify precisely the mode of action of this PH1 locus, and they found that it first promotes homologous pairing rather than suppressing homologous pairing, and also it prevents homologous recombination intermediates to become crossovers. The second gene, which is really important as well, is the PH2 locus that have been discovered more than 50 years ago. And the, the phenotype of this gene is easily observable in the with uh, wide relative hybrid, so in hybrid situation. So we cross uh, wheat with rye, for example, and in that case, there is no homologous chromosome, meaning that if you see uh, chiasmata in, that, in myocytes, it corresponds to homologous recombination. In the Y-type context, as expected, you got a, a high number of univalents and sometimes rare, rare uh, rod bivalents. But in the absence of pH2, the number of rod bivalents is quite highly increased. And this, in this cell, for example, we have five uh, events of homeologous recombination. So it is a key suppressor of homeologous recombination. Um, Quite a while ago, it has been identified that the PH2 locus C locali is localized on the short arm of the 3D chromosome. There are two available mutants, and I will come back to them later in my talk. The first one is an irradiation mutant, which is called PH2A. And using the Centene with rice uh, genome, which was known at that time, the deletion, they show that it was a terminal deletion that should be about 80 megabases uh, long. The second mutant is an EMS mutant, which is called PH2. The PH2 locus is of great interest because it first has a minimal, uh, it, it induces a minimal description of endogenous homologous recombination. And it also reinforces the PH1B effect on promoting homeologous recombination. So it could have a great interest in pre-breeding uh, schema. Despite a uh, few attempts over the last decades of cloning this gene, no causative gene have been uh, identified, but few candidates have been proposed. And among them, WM1 gene family, which is wheat meiosis one, WM3, WM5, and the MERSH7 uh, 3D gene. When I joined the PSOD laboratory, the main goal of my postdoc was to uh, perform the positional cloning of PH2. To, to achieve this, this goal, we had two complementary strategies. The first one was to um, in the characterize the two known mutants using exome and transcriptome sequencing and also to reduce the size of the deletion to precise pH2 location on the, on the 3B, 3D chromosome using a deletion mutant. And those two, two strategies were possible because, of the, um, because the reference genome of wheat was now uh, available. Those two strategies were supposed to give us a list of potential candidates that we were planning to validate functionally. So the first things we did is to try to identify precisely the deletion breakpoints within the PH2A mutants. To do this, we use we genotype the PH2A mutants using a high density SNPs array that was developed in the Steck Institute. And we use the signal intensity obtained with all mutants, and we normalize uh, those signal intensities for each marker using the Chinese spring uh, reference. And using um, R script developed by Jonathan Kitt in the JDEC Institute, we are able to find, uh, to precisely detect the deletion in the genome. 
And you can see here on the 3D chromosome that the PH2A mutant indeed uh, has a, a long deletion at the terminal position. And the deletion breakpoint was actually about 121 megabases, which was longer than previously estimated. In order to verify and check the, the deletion extension, we performed exome capture of the PH2A mutant that was done in Adelaide. And as you can see here, on the terminal part of the 3D chromosome for the PH2A mutant, we didn't get any signal and starting only from that position, which was different from the PH2B and the Y type that got a signal over all other 3B, 3D chromosomes. So the exact position of this uh, starting signal is um, 121.16 megabases, which is a huge ration uh, about the size of the Arabidopsis genome, actually. And using the reference genome for the wheat, um, for wheat, we identified exactly 1,577 genes that were potential candidates for PH2. We also uh, performed an exome capture of the EMS-induced PH2B mutants and compare, compare the data with the Chinese spring reference genome. That was supposed to give us all the mutation presence in the PH2A deletion in order to uh, identify the potential genes that could uh, be responsible, the mutation responsible for the phenotype of these mutants. We identified 165 single nucleotide differences between the two within the 121 megabase uh, region. Among them, 59 SNPs were in the genic regions, I mean the CDS, 5' prime and 3' prime UTR, and in the promoter regions. Among them, 36 were exonic mutations, including 13 synonymous, 21 non synonymous and two nonsense mutations, and also one mutation that could affect uh, the splicing junction of a gene. If we consider only those who could affect uh, protein sequence and protein function, we were able to reduce to 24 genes the number of potential uh, candidate genes because they carry uh, one of those mutations. Those genes were dispersed over the full length of the deletion and in order to reduce and precise the size, the, the location of the PH2 gene, in parallel we produced uh, 3D deletion lines, meaning wheat lines uh, in which the 3D chromosome carry a deletion which can be of different size. To do this, we crossed a nulli tetrasomic line that do not contain any 3D, 3D chromosome with a monosomic addition line uh, carrying the, the 2C chromosome from Aegilop cylindrica. This line has the particularity of producing half of the gametes that are healthy and contain the 2C chromosome and half of the gametes that do not contain the 2C that show a breakage that are mainly dissolved deletion on chromosomes. Actually, on the 2C chromosome, there are selfish genetic elements that by the, this process uh, favor the transmission to the next generation. After the cross, we obtain lines with half of the genome healthy but without the 3D chromosome and half of the genome that can contain a different breakage. Among them, we selected all the lines that um, carry a deletion on 3D and we ended up with 113 deletion lines. And using uh, 3D specific markers, we characterized precisely the length of the deletion and we showed that they were ranking from 6.5 to 357 megabases. Our colleagues in uh, Czech Republic uh, checked the deletion of the deletion using FISH. You can see here the full 3D chromosome and in all those lines, one part of the short arm of 3D is missing and in those one, the long arm, part of the long arm is missing. And all those lines are now available, uh, made, were made available for the scientific community. Uh, with the purpose of cloning PH2, we selected about 25 uh, deletion lines that carry deletion from zero to 140 megabases 
all terminal deletion. And we cross all of them with a right relative, RI, for example. We obtain a haploid hybrids and check the meiotic behavior of those lines. As you can see here, the, for all the lines that contain a, a deletion which was smaller or equal to 64.9 megabases, we get a phenotype which was similar to the Y type with a lot of uh, univalence. But when the deletion carried by those uh, hybrids were 79.2 megabases or longer, we got a quite a high chiasma, chiasma frequency, which is a very similar to what was observed in the PH2B, uh, PH2A mutants. So this allowed us to, to refine the PH2 locus to a 14.3 megabase region on the two on the 5D uh, 3D sorry chromosome. So this uh, this region contains exactly 100 genes. So using the in-depth characterization of those mutants, we ended up with 24 candidates. Using the um, deletion lines, we ended up with 100 candidate genes. And when we compare those two lists, we were lucky enough to find only one gene that was uh, identical that was um, identical in the two lists. This gene is localized here within those 14.3 megabase region, and it's actually MERS7 3D. This gene is quite a long gene, about 10 kb, and contains 17 exons. It is encoding a quite heavy protein of 1,200 amino acids with a DNA binding domain and an ATPase domain. So what do we know about MERS7? MERS7 is a MUT-S homologue 7, which is a member of the DNA mismatch repair family, uh, together with MERS2, MERS3, and MERS6. MERS7 is specific to plants, and it seems that it's uh, arise from uh, very early in plant evolution, um, probably via a duplication of the MERS6-like uh, MERS uh, gene. All the members, MERS7 and all the members of this family uh, are known to maintain genome stability by assuring DNA mismatch recognition in the mismatch repair pathway, they are actually the first one uh, detecting the presence of mismatches in uh, the double strand DNA and promote the recruitment of the next protein that will remove and then repair the, the mismatch. They are working uh, as a heterodimer and MERS7 is working with MERS2. Together, they recognize a subset of uh, mismatches, uh, the five uh, identified here. What we know uh, also is that MERS7 uh, has the role of suppressing homeologous recombination in tomato. Actually, that have been shown in uh, tomato lines where we have one additional homeologous chromosome from one uh, wide relative. And in the absence of MERS7, uh, we got an increase, a modest increase of homeologous recombination, about 16%. But this is still very uh, consistent with what we observe uh, here in wheat. What happened to MERS7 3D in the PH2B mutants? The exome capture data show that uh, PH2B contain, uh, the MERS7 3D in PH2B contain a transition G2A, which is localized in the very first nucleotide of the intron 5, and that have been uh, checked by Sanger sequencing. In order to verify, I mean, in order to determine if uh, this mutation could affect intron 5 splicing, we performed RNA sequencing uh, from Antares, from PH2B and Y type plants, at early meiosis. And what we found uh, here are the data you have the MERS7 3D gene, and you can see here in this little zoom that the exon 5 and exon 6 are present in the mRNA in both uh, PH2B and Y type, but also we got um, the intron 5 uh, representation reads in the PH2B mutants only. And it's what you can see here in purple, uh, intron 5 is actually conserved 
in uh, mRNA on PH2B. What can happen is that this mutation affects the splicing uh, pattern, which is present here, which is not anymore recognized, so intron 5 is kept, and a downstream um, splicing pattern could be used with this one. This would induce a frame shift and a preventive stop codon, so MERS7-3D is probably truncated uh, in the PH2B mutant. In order to uh, validate, to functionally validate the role of MERS7-3D in wheat, we selected EMS mutants from the wheat uh, timing population from John Innes Center in the UK, and I will present you the result from only one mutant. This mutant has a mutation in that position and induced uh, a premature stop codon and probably uh, produce, is responsible for the production of a truncated MERS7 3D protein. Importantly, no other mutated gene uh, in the PH2A deletion have been uh, identified in this mutant. We crossed this mutant with a wide variety, in that case, Agilops variabilis. We didn't choose right just because the accession of the mutant, which is Cadenza, is very hard to cross with uh, right, so we use these other species. And again, we try to we, we analyze the meiotic uh, behavior of those haploid hybrids. And contrary to the Y type, where a lot of univalent is observed as expected, in the absence of the MERS7 3D uh, protein, we saw a quite a high number of what bivalent, meaning that homologous recombination is clearly increased in this context. That have been checked in the high number of uh, cells, and we observe here clearly an increase of about 5.5 fold increase in the chiasma frequency within the mutant, so within the genome wide homologous recombination, meaning that MERS7 3D clearly inhibits homologous recombination in wheat. We also wanted to look at the impact of MERS7 3D in homologous recombination. To do this, we analyzed myocytes of wheat, white type wheat, with a lot of ring bivalence. But in the absence of MERS7 3D, we found rod bivalence and sometimes even univalent, meaning that homologous cross uh, crossovers are actually missing uh, in these mutants that have been made in, uh, I mean, counted in a large number of cells. And you see here a clear reduction in homologous recombination. And that was completely similar and almost identical to what we see also in the PH2B in, that have been reported uh, in the previous studies. So it seems that MERS7 3D promotes homologous recombination. So here we are in the context where two MERS7 3D gene is present. In that case, none of them. And in order to uh, identify the MERS7 3D has a dosage sensitive effect, we analyze uh, homologous recombination in the heterozygous plants where only one copy of MERS7 3D uh, is present. And we found an intermediate phenotype between the white type plants and the mutants, all those differences were uh, statistically significant, meaning that MERS7 3D as other meiotic genes seems to have a dosage sensitive uh, effect. So just to summarize at this point, uh, the absence of MERS7 3D fully recapitulates the PH2 uh, phenotypes with a slight reduction in homologous recombination in wheat and a clear increase in homologous recombination in wheat viabilis uh, hybrids. In order to determine if this meiotic disorder can affect and can impact um, the fertility of the plants, we analyzed uh, the percentage, the, the viability of the pollen using Alice under staining. Um, and we found that in the mutants, we have a slight reduction in the proportion of viable uh, pollen grains. And regarding the number of seeds per spike, uh, we found very slight reduction in the mutant, but that was not significantly different. So meaning that this mutation uh, do not affect drastically the wheat fertility, which is quite uh, interesting in reading schema. 
we were also wondering about the expression of MERS 7 3G and to have an idea of its expression during meiosis, we analyzed the RNA abundance uh, in antes at late leptotin, zygotin pakitin, diplotin diakinase, and metaphase 1. And as you can clearly see here, uh, MERS 7 3D is expressed at all these stages, which is consistent with its role uh, early in meiosis in suppressing homeologous recombination. But we found that the other homeologous copies, 3A and 3B, were as well very much uh, expressed in those different uh, stages. Also, the three homeologous copies were expressed, expressed in somatic tissues, leaf, root, and stem, as expected as well, because we know that they are uh, working a critical role in uh, genome uh, maintenance. What about MERS 7 3A and 3B, the two uh, other homeologous copies of, uh, of this gene? We compare the sequence of the gene and the protein and found that they share more than 97% of identity at the nucleotide level and more than 96% at amino acid level, meaning that those three homeologues are very, very much uh, conserved. Because of the potential um, redundancy, functional redundancy of this protein, and also because of the location of 3A and 3B, it is reasonable to assume that they could be the minor suppressors of homeologous recombination that have been already described on 3A and 3B chromosome. So this is only speculative to date and needs to be uh, checked, of course, experimentally. So to summarize, we showed that the PH2 uh, gene locates within a 14.3 megabase region uh, on the short arm of the 3D chromosome. We show that MERS 7 3D is the only gene localized within this region that contains an EMS-derived SNP susceptible to affect uh, the protein sequence in the PH2B mutants. Using an additional mutant of uh, MERS 7 3D, we show that this mutation fully recapitulates the PH2 phenotype in regards to both homologous and homeologous recombination. And I didn't show it here, but we were also able to exclude all the previously proposed candidates for PH2, except MERS 7 3D, because they are actually not localized uh, within the newly refined PH2 locus, this 14.3 megabase region, and they are not mutated in the PH2B uh, mutants. So with all those data, we were able to, to demonstrate that MERS 7 3D is the causative gene for the well-known PH2 and solving this uh, half a century old uh, question or mystery. Okay, so MERS 3D is a key inhibitor of homeologous recombination in wheat, but what could be its mode of action? What we think is MERS 3D could be involved in the initial state of meiotic recombination in um, impacting or making a decision in the recombination partner choice. It is possible that MERS 7 3D, probably with its partner, MERS 2, could recognize the mismatches formed during the invasion of a single strand DNA within uh, an homeologous sequence, the homeologous chromosomes. And when it's recognized this, it could uh, impact and promote the heteroduplex rejection of this structure. So that has been already described for the MERS uh, protein. This uh, single strand DNA would be free to invade a new sequence and eventually the homologous uh, chromosome and we could end up to uh, homologous crossovers. So by this mechanism, we think that MERS 7 3D could uh, impact the choice of the two potential partners. In the absence of MERS 7 3D, those intermediates would not be uh, recognized and disrupt, so th that could be responsible for the increase of homologous uh, crossover that we see in the mutants. 
And because these uh, embedding strand, this structure are not redirected, uh, are no longer redirected to the homologous chromosome, it is possible that this indirectly uh, is responsible for reduction of homologous uh, crossovers in those cells. So to go a bit further in this analysis, the thing that we, we would like to, to do now or would be very interesting to, to decipher is the mode uh, of action and the interaction between the two genes that are now uh, cloned, the PH1 and PH2. Uh, it is possible that they are not working at the same state and maybe work together as a, um, as a how to say, um, different stages to, to control meiotic recombination and make sure that uh, homeologous recombination do not uh, go into crossover. It would be very interesting as well to, to combine these two mutations and to see if we can go further uh, in the improvement of the efficiency and ease of integration. That would be very interesting in reading uh, programs. And also, of course, we want to investigate if the three MERS-7 copies in wheat, uh, what is the relative impact and uh, the combinatorial effects uh, of those potential uh, of this homologous gene and potentially could as well increase uh, the efficiency of integrations. So all the data that I show you today are now online. They were uh, actually published early this year. Uh, together with additional data, data that I didn't present here on the conservation of MERS-7 uh, within wild and uh, domesticated wheat varieties and also in, in grasses. And with this, I would like to thank all, the, all my colleagues who were involved in that uh, adventure. Pierre Sodi, the leader of the group at the Schleck Institute, Isabelle Lomé, who made an amazing job in plant caring and also helped me a lot with crosses. Jonathan Kitt and Hélène Rambert uh, for the bioinformatic uh, support. Jan Bartosz and Radim Sassina, uh, who performed the, the production of the 3D division lines, the characterization, and also the analysis of the phenotype of the hybrids. Miroslava Karafiatoda for the fish experiments. And in Adelaide, Ute Bauman, who made most of the bioinformatic uh, analysis of this story. Ryan Watford, who helped me a lot at the late stage in writing the manuscript, and also Tim Sutton, uh, that was part of this adventure. I would like to thank all the founders, and thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I would be happy to, to answer them. Thank you so very much, Heidi, for an excellent webinar. I Thanks. truly enjoyed listening all the uh, story about the PH2 genes. So I'd like to remind everyone that uh, you can, if you have any questions, you can type into question uh, answer panels. Uh, while you guys uh, are typing into it, I just want to ask a couple of questions to Heidi. Mm -hmm. So I'll start first as an organizer. So Heidi, the first thing is that I just was wondering that if anybody was interested in editing that genes that you identified so far, and although it's going to take like six more months to validate or just to develop a new germplasm, would it be possible, what do you say? Is it possible to use pH2 for introgressions? You mean to perform introgression? Yeah. So it had been made already quite a while ago, but because the efficiency is not as uh, strong than for the PH2, PH1 mutations, actually it's definitely more the PH1 genes mutation that have been used to, to make intro introgression, but it's possible also for the PH2. What we think is, of course, to combine the two to have a greater effect, right, and to improve uh, the efficiency of introgression. Great, thank you. So uh, we have uh, um, a number of questions already uh, in the panel. I'll start from the beginning. I'm, I'm trying to just uh, get all the questions asked, but if I cannot or we cannot just get it done, please just uh, email us 
and we'll try to get back to you with the written answers. So mm -hmm. I'll start with the first one, and it, uh, it says, very, very nice uh, webinar. Can you give a, a real example of the use of this PH2 2 mutation to promote the homologous recombination in any breeding program? Yeah, I don't have the, the name exactly, but there are at least three examples in the literature. They were used quite a while ago. Yeah, I don't have the, the exact name of the, the story, sorry. But yeah, it has been made, but as I said previously, quite uh, rarely because of the effect that was not as high as pH1. Thank you. The other uh, question I will continue. What are the expression levels across the tissues of the MASH7, MASH7, 3A, and 3B in the PH2A mutants? Oh, mm, so in the PH2A mutants, we do not have the genes, right? So it shouldn't be expressed at all, and we shouldn't have any RNA. So yeah, I, I'm sure we, we checked it. <laughs> Right, okay, good. All right, um, with that, I'll just continue. I think um, they asked me the same, same question. I think I asked, can we do the CRISPR Cas9 mutation for MASH7? If yes, what will be the phenotype that you're expecting? And is there any other effect of the MASH7? I mean, phenotypic effect, that's what um, it was asked. So CRISPR-Cas9 have not been made to, to date, and it's something that we plan in the PSO laboratory to, to do it. Uh, of course, it is uh, challenging it, it with uh, at the moment. Uh, what, I uh, what I expect is to have a similar phenotype that we have in the PH2 mutants or in the MERS-7 uh, EMS mutants that I show you here and about the phenotype the plant looks very similar between ph2 and the white type uh, ph2 plant and the mesh 7 uh, 3d so we do not see any clear effect on the phenotype and either in the fertility which is very very similar i can just say a, a little drop in the pollen viability but that is tiny great thank you and then there's another question that I will ask you now, that um, your MI chromosome, MI chromosome pairing data, have you corrected these scores for the PH2 two lines for the presence of the structural aberrations that must have accumulated over the generations? Oh. Um, so the, the PH2 B mutant is quite uh, old now. It has been uh, produced uh, maybe decades ago, and it has been uh, backcrossed many times. So all the other are, actually there are parts that are fixed as well. Um, so maybe this person is concerned about other mutation that could affect the phenotype as well, right? So what we did, and I didn't show it here because it's quite recent data, is to cross together all the PH2 EMS mutants, PH2B, and also all uh, MSH7 3D mutants. We cross them together and check the phenotype in the hybrid in order to remove the potential effect of a background mutation. And in those, uh, we found exactly the same phenotype that in the parent. So have, these have to be uh, repeated. Uh, but yeah, we are definitely sure that it cannot be anything else. We I'll think. just read the follow-up questions. I mean, well, the continuous of the questions. When you score the pairing in such lines, you um, knock not um, only the effect of the mutation on this particular uh, myocyte, but also the accumulated effects of the mutation since it was the first created. Mm, I'm not sure about that question. So, so first, I think it's preferable now to use the term recombination that pairing if we are talking about the metaphase one, uh, a phenotype. Um, so meaning if the phenotype that we see is 
uh, due to the MERS 7 3D mutation, but some others in the background, right? Is it the, the question? I so think I, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess we answer that by crossing the two together and showing that it's still the same phenotype. So, yeah. Um, and we also compare the sequence uh, of the PH2B mutants and or mutants, MSH7 3D mutant, and we show that in the full 121 megabase region, we do not have any other uh, potential gene which is mutated in the two uh, background, in the two genotypes. So we are confident that it's not another mutation somewhere else. Okay, the, the other question is that wouldn't you worry about detrimental effects in the case of PH1, PH2 uh, double mut mutations? Mm, so what do you mean about detrimental effects? For sure we will increase, I mean not for sure, in some crosses have been shown that the effect is stronger with the two mutations. It is not true for all the different crosses. And detrimental, I guess it's for the fertility of the plants. Uh, and in that case, it's true that for the pH1 mutant um, and Z4B2, there, are, there is a drop uh, of fertility, which is not the case for pH2. I'm not sure it will be um, stronger in the, the double mutant, if it's the question. Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, well, they they will follow up question or e they'll email us or email you um, if there's the more to clarify that the answer. So the other question is that what do you think can be the case for the Durham leap where the D genome is not present? Um, In the what? Can you repeat? Durham leap. Uh, what do you think about this case for the Durham leap since there's a, no D genome? Could it that be the PH2? job taken over by the 3A mm, and or that, 3B? That it's possible uh, indeed. So there are, uh, we think that the three copies have an effect on the phenotype, on the recombination, uh, homologous recombination suppression. Uh, the 3D definitely has the highest effect, 3A intermediate and 3B uh, a smaller effect. And it is very probable that the the free a still have a, a clear function on this. It is not alone because the pH one is is present too, right? But yeah, yeah, we we can think. That. I mean, we we need to do the the mutants, right, to to check all those questions. Good. Uh, the uh, the other question that I'm gonna um, also follow up with: uh, any interactions between the pH one and pH two? So it is something that we want to, to find out, right? Um, according to, to our model, we think that uh, MERS 7 would, as I said, work in the initial part and the choice between partners, um, yeah, recombination partners. And it has been shown that, that this ZIP4B2 is working maybe a bit later when the double holiday junction is already in place and will uh, prevent the resolution. Uh, to crossover. So we think they are working at two different steps on the, of the process. So maybe not interacting directly together, but yeah, that is only speculative. And again, we need to, to look more closer to, to have an idea of this and answer the question. Great, thank you. And uh, the other question is that um, a little bit longer, but I'm going to try to read it slowly. The PH1B mutation has been shown to be deleterious for weak genotype, weak, uh, karyotype stability. Do you think that combining PH2B with PH1B can be a better transfer breeding strategies than the use of PH2B alone? So indeed, the PH1B um, mutation induces many uh, damages of the phenotype and meiosis, etc. But now that the CRISPR-Cas9 ZIP4B2 have been produced, it seems that these mutants increase homologous recombination, but 
the side effect is not as strong. So I would uh, recommend and I will try to, to combine the, the point mutation instead of the huge uh, deletion that were uh, identified a, a long time ago. In that case, I, I guess we should reduce those uh, side problems. Great, thank you. That the quick question: That is there any uh, the, uh, from the question panel? Is there any epistatic effect uh, between pH one and pH two? Any what effect uh, combining uh, epistatic epistasis between pH one and pH two, or epistatic epistasis epistatic epistatic effect? <laughs> is there an epistasis between pH one and pH two? So I'm not sure I really understand the, this word. Right. I'm sorry, but um, th there are additional effects uh, in some crosses, but not in in all crosses. Yeah. Uh, Good. So yeah, I think many things remain to be done, right, in the interaction between the two, and we don't have many many data yet. Well, uh, well, we're almost running out of time, but I just want to ask the last question. Is it uh, known if SPO11 interact with the MESH 7-2 complexes? Do you have... No, I'm not aware of this, but we know that in RISE, uh, MESH 7 is interacting with MICA, and MICA is actually an ortholog of FLIP, which is working with a uh, fidgetin-like protein. And this protein, uh, fidgetin-like, is involved in the invasion and the choice between homologous uh, chromosome and the sister chromatin. So it is very probable that it is during this first stage, probably not during the break and SPO11, but probably uh, during the invasion stage, of course. Right. Great. Uh, well, one last thing that when we have a couple, one minute and uh, what, any thoughts on uh, which one is more ancient, pH1 or pH2 is more ancient in terms of el evolutionary origin? Uh, so, because pH2, pH1 is on the 5B, probably it was present uh, in the tetraploids and the pH2 on the D comes afterwards. Great. With that, I'd like to thank you very much again for the excellent webinar. And thank I'd you like very to much. Thank, yeah, great to have you, and it's a really interesting story, and we, I truly enjoyed listening. So I'd like to thank everybody for participating uh, in our webinar, IWGSC webinar, and hope to see you all for our next webinar, IWGSC webinar series as well. With that, I'd like to thank again and close the meeting. Have a great day.